Hi, welcome to the Stitch TV show. I'm Lynn. I okay, am still Lynn. That's delightful. Yes. Hi, I'm Pam. <laughs> We're happy you're joining us today. <laughs> the Stitch is an online quilting talk show, the perfect soundtrack for your sewing room. Join us as we chat about current topics in the quilting world, techniques to improve your own projects, and fun stories about our quilts. Our episodes come out twice a month, complemented by virtual stitching, celebrity interviews, and podcasts. Learn more about <laughs> us at thestitchtvshow.com. Our show today is brought to you by the Precut Store. Uh, behold the amazing selection of precuts. Precuts could be anything from fat quarter bundles, charm packs, layer cakes, jelly rolls, all that cool stuff. Uh, and we're very excited. That the Precut store is also sponsoring a giveaway. So, on our blog, you will find a link to a raffle copter entry to win three fabulous charm packs, flour mill by Corey Yoder, biscuits and gravy. Very Southern. Biscuits and gravy. That's oh. right. Uh, by Basic Gray for Moda. And then uh, this fabulous, very bright and special designer palette series from Kaufman and wait there's more basics that is such a good deal <gasps> oh yeah and this this is just uh the jelly rolled basics snow. in snow which is a very it's one of the colors I use the most honestly from Moda Bella so you entered to win before August 24th thank you to the pre-cut store for that huzzah so today we're going to be talking about free motion quilting on domestic machine and the cost benefit analysis of pre-cut fabrics. We're joined by my quilt. It says by Lynn's quilt. So I'm like, Lynn's quilt, my, whatever it is, because Lynn's I didn't know quilt. the name of it. <laughs> um, what is it? What is the name of it? I don't know that I have a name of this quilt. How bad is that? I thought you named it. Did I? I thought you did. We should check the label, which we're not going to do right now. I don't think there is a label. Don't tell. But the pattern is from Kimberly Imo. Yes. We know that much. Yes, it is. It's from Kimberly Imo. I think it's called Star Magic or something. It's Lone Star Burst. I think there it's Lone Star Burst. There That's what go. I named my version of it when I did it. I didn't. But these are all made from like jelly roll strips. So exactly. behold, you can do something awesome with your pre-cuts from the pre-cut store. Yep. Yes. And those are just jelly roll... For the piano key, too. Yeah. And that's Tula Pink, isn't it? A lot of it's Tula Pink. I did have to supplement from my stash because the Tula Pink didn't have 42 in it. It only had 30-something Yeah, I think it, it had 38, so, I remember. Yeah, so I had to supplement some stuff cool. from my stash. Awesome. So I did that. All right. So, uh, Lynn, what's been going on? What's that? What's happening? I, I haven't been up to as much as you have, so what have you been doing? Well, you've been doing a lot of planning. You've been getting ready. I um, just recently taught a bag class at you a local did. shop. You did. How'd they go? Went good. What I like about this particular class that I taught is that um, everyone finished. Because <laughs> sometimes you get <laughs> That's like... That's really important to Pam. Everyone wants to get to the part where you put the zipper in, but when you're doing bags, there's still some stuff that has to happen after you put the zipper in. Yes. Like you have to birth the bag. You have to like turn it right side out. Yes. Uh, and then you got to put the little finishing touches. Because honestly, when it comes to bag making, um, it can still look handmade. It'll look more homemade if you don't do like uh, top stitching an eighth of an inch from all the finished edges. That really helps give it a little more polish and a little more finesse. Um, so we, you kind of want to get to that so everyone can see like, oh, it's done done. Like, because you, when you do a class, you want people to leave feeling satisfied, not like, well. Pam wants people to I leave satisfied. Jacked up my zipper. I mean, I got paid either yeah. way, so. <laughs> I've been writing classes. That's what I've been doing. I've been writing yeah. all the descriptions and um, supply lists and working on lectures for us kind of thing. Or me. <laughs> Pam's decided she's sending me out. Yeah. Well, we're doing one together coming up. Yes. Um, although I'm not cited in the... The description you by the kilt. I was like, oh, sweet, I'm off the hook. Nope. <laughs> <Just> she's, <laughs> and she's excited about that part, which is funny. She sends me out to do all these lectures. Yeah. So it's good, though. I like them. So. Well, you got to remember, Lynn, that I don't like leaving my house. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> I know. So anyway. Well, one of the things that I have taught previously is free motion quilting on a domestic machine. Yes. I did that for our guild. Yes, you did. Stressed me out. <laughs> Ooh. 
So where it gets tricky in teaching a class, if everyone's bringing their own machine, which is different from if you take a class at uh, a quilt show or at a, at a store, they tend to all have the same machine. But when everyone brings their own, it's like you got to hope everyone's machine is in good working order, that they got the right kind of needle, that their machine is friendly right. with the concept of free motion quilting. And some machines are friendlier with it than others. And it honestly it depends on my machine. It's not like, oh, this particular brand is horrible at it. I've, n- I've not seen ho- just wholesale, like, this is bad. Don't use this machine. Like, featherweights, don't do that for free motion quilting because, A, the bed is way small. <laughs> like, that's not going to work. Yeah, that wouldn't be fun. Not fun. Not fun, no. And I don't even know if they make it. They probably make a darning foot for it. But it's like a single needle hole, which is what you want. But anyway. Yeah. I don't know. I don't use my featherweight as much as I should. I don't think you use it at all, do you? I've cleaned it there and you go. oiled the whole thing. But yeah, I don't I don't I should use it more than I do. It's cute. It is cute. And it's an anniversary one. Like it's a collectible. It's very collectible because of the century. It's the century one that it came out. So I should use it more, but I don't. You I don't. So Give us tips on these domestic, that's our first topic, is domestic machine quilting tips. I actually wrote some stuff down. Why don't you go first? (laughs) And then I will. Because, well, and I'm, you know, I'm a long-arm quilter, but that being said, I have quilted on my domestic (gasps) machine. I know, it's not a lot, but I have done it. So these are my tips. Um, Work small. I, I like most of the stuff that I do on a domestic is small. So I work in a small space. Mm-hmm. I don't try to, you know, what I can do with my long arm is make these big, long, you know, lines and stuff. I can't do that on a domestic. So I really have to kind of change my, I don't know how to do it on domestic. So I have to change <laughs> my concept and I work in a small space before I move stuff around. Um, I always stop with the needle down. Yes. So that, if you have a button on your machine where it says needle down, I always stop with the needle down. And I think that that helps in case you need to turn or pivot. You always want to stop with the needle down. See, I know some stuff. Um, (laughs) and when I have to do it on a domestic because I don't have to think as much here, although my domestic has a stitch regulator that I can turn on, um, but I can do it without a stitch regulator. But before I go to the project I'm doing this on, I always practice because there's a rhythm. You have to get into the rhythm of your body and the speed of the machine. The rhythm is going to get you. (laughs) It's true. It's the rhythm that's going to get you. Yeah. So <laughs> I think it's like this dance of, am I moving at the same rate that my machine is moving? And your foot pedal. And my foot pedal. And yes. so I always practice before I like go to that whatever thing is. Much like dancing, uh, the speed of your feet needs to match the speed of your hands. Really? In da- I've never thought about that in dancing. Okay. Well, think about I'm it. If you are doing a slow dance, but your arms are doing, like, crazy hand jive, it doesn't look right. No, you're right. It doesn't. Yeah. So there you go. There you go. Pro tip. <laughs> okay. Well, let's back it up for a minute. Okay. About, well, like, those are all my tips. Well, yes. Like, and I'm done. And Thank you for playing. Now it's my show. It's spam show. <laughs> so. She sends me out, but she gets the whole show. Yes, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So go. All right. Let's talk about setting up your machine first. Because I think that is like the first hurdle. We talked a little bit about like, maybe don't use a featherweight. So in theory, any machine, any sewing machine will work for free motion quilting. There are different things that will impact how successful you are at it. And honestly, a lot of it is how do you adapt to compensate for the features of your particular machine? Why did you look like that? Uh, Because I just remembered another thing I have to do. Drop in its setting of the machine. You have to drop the feed dogs. No, you don't. I always drop the feed dogs. (gasps) Oh, so here's the big, de- well, one of the big debates. There are two options. So your feed dogs are what grabs the fabric from underneath and keeps it moving forward. Now, if you're doing a free motion design that d- isn't moving forward, but maybe moving backwards or to the side, the feed dogs can get in the way, get in the way, cause some friction. But there are some workarounds because, so I have 
Um, what do you tape over it? No. Okay. Okay. So what I do for mine, I used to drop the feed dogs. Then something went hitchy in my machine and they never came back up and I had to take it into the shop. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> so what I do instead is set the stitch length to zero. So then the feed dogs, instead of coming up and moving forward and dropping down, they just oh. come up and down. So you can do either or you could do both. I think you drop the feed dogs and set your stitch length to zero. That feels like overkill. Um, some quilters have said that dropping their feed dogs changes how the tension discs in the bottom engage. Or the, the feed in there. I don't know that I've noticed that. But I don't do it enough that... So, this is where experimentation and finding what's right for your machine comes in. You can yes, either I would say that's drop true. the feed dogs or try to set your stitch length to zero. Or like the short... I think sometimes it just goes down to like 0.5 might be the shortest. Which is essentially the same as just going up and down. Now, in addition to that, you can also cover it. Cover the feed dogs. So you can get... Here's the ghetto solution. Cover it. Here's the redneck engineering solution. You get a business card and you poke a hole in it <laughs> for your needle to go up and down and you tape that over your feed dogs. And you could do that even if you can't shorten your stitch length to zero or drop them. Like, you could do that. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. You could also invest... With, in like, a, painter's tape so it didn't... Yeah, tape it down your, with painter's tape. Yeah. Don't use duct tape. That'll leave sticky residue on there. Yeah. Um, alternately, you could invest in a product like the Supreme Slider which is like a Teflon coated thing with a little hole cut out that you put over your machine bed and getting that slick surface will help the quilt sandwich move around as well. Now the trick is um, that does have a grippy back, but I do a line of painter's tape on mine anyway, just in case, because one time it like came unsticky and it slid and I sewed through it. <laughs> Ooh. Whoops. Oops. So don't like that. Big debate. Again, it's what works for your machine. So get some, muslin or some fat quarters that you don't really like anymore and make some sandwiches and practice and see. So practice, I was practice. a good tip that I gave practice. Yes. <laughs> the other thing that's helpful, if you don't have a machine that is sitting, so the bed of the machine is flush with the tabletop, like it's dropped in is another way that's described. You want to try and extend the bed of your machine so you've got more surface for the quilt sandwich to be flat before it like drops off the edge. I, yes. I mean, I will say that that is something I would invest in for any machine that doesn't sit in a table. And there are, I mean, there are generic ones. You can get one specific to your machine, of yep. course. Those are usually a little more expensive. I don't know. They're, what, $100 or something? Yeah. Or but I've seen them um, offered, you know, online. Not, harder to find in person, but there are a lot of companies that make um, generic ones that, like, the components that slide around the um, arm of the machine will adjust back and forth so you can accommodate any size bed of the machine. I will say I don't do domestic machine quilting, but I have a travel machine and I carry that mm -hmm. big table with me everywhere and I don't like sewing without it. Just regular sewing, not even quilting. So yeah. I think it's worth the investment. Yeah. And there's even small portable tables that are maybe $300 US. I'm not sure about international how they work. Um, where it, they will make a custom insert so you can set your machine down in there. Now, so I have recently invested in a Handy Quilter Suite 16, uh, which gives me a nice big bed. But before that, I have my Janome that's set in a table. Uh, and I actually set my ironing board up behind my table. So my normal right. table is about like that much space beyond the, you know, the back of the machine. But my ironing board back there gives me another um, good 12, 15 inches extra. Right, yeah. And I just honestly haven't taken it down. I probably should, and then I'd get a little more room in my sewing room. I'm like, yeah, it's fine. That's where the cats sit, honestly, so they can look out the window, and it doesn't get... No, it gives you way. extra space. I, I like those tables. Now, what I don't like about them is that the fabric cover on the ironing board does create a little bit of friction. So if I were quilting on that, um, when I go to move quilts back towards me, then I get friction there. That doesn't work great. Um, I have seen creative solutions like covering them with uh, Tyvek material, which is slipperier material. Or honestly, you could do, there's a couple of different materials you could put down there and right. <laughs> get a little less friction. Um, but extending the work surface definitely helps, particularly for big quilts. If you're just doing like a pot holder, yeah, it's not that, there's not a lot of weight to that. But when you get to, oh, if you're trying to quilt a big motif on a big quilt on a domestic machine, that drag becomes very important. And I've seen all kinds of different ways. Like Krista Watson, who owns the Precut Store, um, does a, a smoosh and stuff method. 
So you kind of puddle the quilt sandwich. So you're working in your area and the rest of the quilt is kind of puddled around it. Now we've taken a class from Sue Nichols and she does a roll and like flings it over her shoulder. That seems more organized. I'd like the smishin, yeah, whatever. Now <laughs> smushing, the smush. Well, and stuff. When Sue describes her method, it makes me think of an old school way of referring to female undergarments <laughs> over the shoulder folder holder, which is probably not her intended effect. <laughs> <laughs> probably not. Probably not. Love you, Sue. Probably not. Uh, she probably didn't watch the show. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so y your method there kind of depends on how much space you have. Where the, I mean, if you've got mobility issues and you don't have use of your shoulder, you don't want a quilt hanging off your shoulder anyway. Yeah. Especially in Some Georgia that, in the summer. It's freaking hot They can hot be down heavy. heavy. you got to crank up the AC in that case. Yes. So I have done a king-size quilt, free motion quilted it on my 1992 Singer machine that I got as a high school graduation present. I have um, quilted a quilt on a domestic machine, king size. Yep. And then I went, this is bananas. Yeah, it's bananas. It's doable. I don't doable. ever want to do this again. You got to take ever. a long break. I call it quilt wrestling. Yes. Because I felt like you were just all the time wrestling this big, heavy bohemoth. Yes. You know, it was crazy. So the benefit of quilting on a domestic machine from uh, a long arm is that you've got freedom to move and work on any part of the quilt you want. True. I don't do that. You don't. Uh, which gives you more freedom if you want to use multiple thread colors because you can... So like for this quilt, I could have done all of the teal thread in various stars and then gone and done all of the purple thread. I'm going to take back that statement. I can quilt on whatever part of the quilt I want. You just have to roll it back and forth. I have to roll it back and forth, and I have to quilt or stitch in a ditch the whole quilt first before I go back. Now, do I stitch in the ditch? No. So I just do it a section yeah. at a time. I know that's something, again, that Krista um, recommends is stitching in the ditch around all of your important design element. So maybe it's just outlining this star piece instead of like every individual piece. Right. But that'll help stabilize it and prevent puckering. And a lot of this really depends on how well um, you've basted it. Uh, not going to get into that here because I think we've talked about it before. Different yeah. There. We do bit all different kinds basting. of different ways to baste. Um, I pin baste, uh, which isn't a problem for me when I'm doing domestic machine work because you do have to stop and reposition bulk of quilt anyway. So while I'm doing that, that's when I take the pins out. And I just have to be conscious of how am I going to be quilting this? Let me not put a pin right in the middle of where I need to put <laughs> some thread. So at particular intersections, I will avoid, um, and it, it varies by quilt how I do that. In general, the recommendation is do uh, basting pins hand width apart. I don't usually do that. Hands. You just did all the hands. Hands across America basting <laughs> happening. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Some quilts are more successful than others, as we learned in the last show with our judges' comments. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> some jacked up binding from the Stitch TV show. Ta da! Ta da! Patent pending. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the other thing needle plate. Mm. Most machines come standard with a needle yep. plate, which is the, the piece of metal that goes over where you drop your bobbin in, unless you've got, well, I have a drop in a bobbin on mine. Some bobbins are like the... Berninas are underneath. Yeah, the underneath kind. Yeah. Uh, so the needle plate is where the holes are cut out for the feed dogs. Typically, the hole for the needle is set up to accommodate a zigzag stitch or any decorative stitch. So it is, you know, oval shaped. Like that. Well, and it, on my Berninas, it's as wide as the widest yes. stitch capable of the machine. Which I think is a five millimeter stitch for my Janome. I, just, I think it's Mine's a, a nine. Nine. Mine might be seven. Seven and five. I mean, my widest zigzag my is My like biggest Bernina, I think, is nine. Okay. But the smaller Bernina is, I think, a five or seven. So what can happen sometimes if you're free motion quilting very quickly and you have this wide needle hole is that the thread a... kind of moves around in that hole and it can affect the uh, what you think is tension on the back because your top thread will start to pull through. 
And that's really a function of how that bobbin thread is being fed up to the quilt. So right. one way to compensate for that uh, is if you have a single hole needle plate, which you think, okay, well, uh, isn't there only a single hole uh, for the other one? But single hole just means that it is a very small round circle. Needle go through, that's yes. it. Yes, and if you accidentally try to do a zigzag stitch with that needle It'll plate in, you get a kaboom. <laughs> you break you break your needle. It'll uh, go. Yeah. Although. So mine actually mine. has a hole next to it. So the needle will go down and not break, but then the thread just gathers up <laughs> around this needle plate. And so you, in other words, I'm go not going to jack up your timing. Right. I'm just going to give you some, some thread extra errors. thread. Yes. My Bernina has where you, if you change the needle plate, you can load in there. Now, of course, you have to remember to do this, but you can load in there that you've changed the needle plate, so it will not allow you to sew any stitch that the single hole needle plate can't be accommodated. So it prevents you from breaking a needle. Yeah. If you tell it, hey, machine, I just put in the single hole needle blade. Yeah, and I do have one. I don't use it very often, though. Yeah. Really, that's the, the thing that I use it for most is if I'm, if I know, like, okay, I got to pay attention. It's a lot of small, intense work with a lot of, um, what's the right word? Not intense, but like a lot of switchbacks where there's going to be a lot of very rapid uh, change in direction of the design. Oh, That's where okay. that comes in handy. Yeah, pivoting. So the other thing... Not your feet, but the feet. machine feet. <laughs> feet. <laughs> feet don't fail me now. So for free motion quilting, typically you use a darning foot, and there are a number of styles. So my singer, way back in the day, had <laughs> had like a plastic foot that was kind of oval shaped. And there was a little arm at the top of it, at the top of a spring part that would sit on top of the screw that you use to attach the foot. And it would make the foot hop. And that drove me bananas. I didn't know why the foot needed to hop. Um, there are ways that you can um, modify that foot. In fact, Leah Day has a tutorial on her blog about how she modified it. And really, you kind of like <laughs> push it up so there's no tension on the spring and you wrap a rubber band around it. So it doesn't move. So it keeps it in kind of a more up position instead of being able to hop. So that's one way. Um, now she also recommends, if you want to improve visibility on that kind of plastic foot, go in with a pair of um, snippers and like snip out part of it so it's more of an open toe foot. I was to say, mine is a kind of a C. Yeah, mine looks like a U shape. Yeah. That's what I like to use. There's also... To where you can see in that yeah. area. Yeah. That, to me, gives the most visibility. Now, there's also a closed toe foot, yep, which is like a small one. metal circle. I don't use that one as much. Um, there are also echo feet, which kind of looks like a disc with marked circles inside it, and that helps you do echo quilting. So you can measure a quarter inch away from whatever, you know, whether it's an applique piece or your previous line of stitching. Echo right. Feet. I don't use right. that one. I just kind of eyeball it. I eyeball it. But I do use, at least on the long arm, I do use the edge of that foot on the long arm, which the long arm foot, I have one foot and yeah, it's a circle quarter. and it's a quarter inch. So I just use the edge of the long arm foot to, for my quarter inch measurements. Yes. We're hearing banging. I'm sure that's my children upstairs. <laughs> Stop wrestling. <laughs> Behave like people. <laughs> Not orangutans. <laughs> <laughs> Practice. Now, there's also an actual free motion ruler foot, Oh, which is, uh, if you look at the profile of it, is a taller foot. So it's got a good quarter inch of metal, and it's usually like just a, you know, a round circle like the closed toe, but it's taller because as you butt those rulers up against it, you don't want your ruler to go on top of your foot because then right. your needle's going to hit it, and that's going to end badly. And that's tr that's the same with um, long arm in that yeah. your rulers are thicker because they bump up against that foot so yes. that they can't go under or over it because you don't want to have the needle hit that plastic. Okay. Thread choice. Whatever thread I like. <gasps> Whatever thread works in your machine. Which is the threads I like. Yes. So there are <laughs> brands that people swear by that I have tried to use in my Janome, and it's like, nope. <laughs> Janome. Nope. Did not happen. <laughs> Did not happen. So 
this, you know, and I have had people with my same machine say, oh, I love that thread. It works great. And I'm like, I got, I don't know what I got. I got a persnickety machine who just, it doesn't, and whether it's the mechanics of how I am doing the quilting motion, maybe that's causing it. Maybe it's thread weight. Maybe it's my needle choice because I also find, uh, I can't use the recommended needle. Like so many people swear by, Schwer? They swear by Schmetz. Schwer? They swear by it. Schwer by it. I can use Schmetz needles I like for piecing, schmetz. but I can't use it for free motion quilting. It gives me some skip stitches. And it's it's a good quality needle. It works perfectly fine for everything else. But for free motion quilting, I got to use a Singer. A Singer brand needle. And mind you know me. That's just I know. crazy. It's crazy. And it's oh the God, heavyweight. I'm you're going. And it's the heavyweight denim needle. There you go. And there it is. So, so there's what, all what, kinds of factors that you can switch around to be like, why is my free motion quilt thing look jacked up? Is it tension? Everyone's been like, just fiddle with the tension knob. No, it could be your needle, it could be your thread, it could be your batting. It could, like so many variables. Yeah, so it's it's really trial and error for oh, yeah. what your machine is and what you yes. who you are working in. Yep. So I, I mean my long arm likes a certain thread. Yep. And that's what when she comes over here to quilt, I'm like, you need to get ice cord because that's what it likes. Yep. It's an ice cord loving machine. <laughs> and you put something else in it and it's not a happy camper. It's like this is an ice cord. I don't now, want to talk I find to you. my handy quilter is a little more forgiving of thread type and accommodating of different widths. But I have tried using like a thick decorative thread to embellish like a kind of an, a small art piece and I get skip stitches. It no matter whether I use a, a top stitch needle which has a bigger hole or I use a heavyweight denim needle which is like a bigger needle overall. I have also tried the platinum needles, and those kind of hit or miss on hmm. whether my machine likes them. So platinum, in theory, oh, yeah. has less flex to it when you're going at those high speeds, because high speeds mean heat, and heat makes metal bendier. <laughs> so in theory, platinum has a, a higher melting point than the forged steel, I think, that regular needles are made out of. So... You know, it, uh, it's trial and error. It's so they, you just got to play with your you machine. Play, with play, get a bunch of quilt sandwiches. Get different thread weights. Get different thread weights. Get different needle types. Need different needles. And when play. you find what works, write it down. Yes, and then say this is what I use on your sandwich. Like get a sharpie or a pigment pen, because again, not our and be like I use this needle and this thread and this tension setting. <laughs> And this is happy. Because in addition to the top tension knob, which is easy to find, there is a tension dial on your bobbin case, too. Oh, yes. Now, if you're doing bobbin work on your machine, you play with that. Bobbin work means very heavy thread in the bobbin. Right. A little different from what we're talking about here. Totally. So but I actually... You mess with that. In fact, I have a separate bobbin case. Yes. For my Bernina, so that if I want to use very heavy thread down there... I will mess with that, but I don't mess with the bobbin that I know works well. Yeah. I have two for my Janome, mm -hmm. and they are known as the red bobbin case and the blue bobbin case. And the yes. red bobbin case is what comes with your machine. Uh, the blue bobbin case is uh, tweaked slightly to have uh, less tension in the bobbin than the red one. Um, so, <laughs> in theory, it's better for free motion quilting because you can uh, run that bobbin thread out a little quicker. Now, there are people that swear by use a lighter thread weight in the bobbin versus yes. the heavier. I find it's more important to match color because... You don't get the pokies up because with a little white dot. Yeah, you want even tension between your top and your bottom. And if your top tension's too high, your bobbin thread's going to show through. Guess what? If it's the same thread, you can't really tell unless you get eyelashing, which is when... Uh, mostly ha usually happens on the back yeah. if it's going to happen anywhere. Yep. And that's when the top thread comes through so much. And the bottom, the bobbin tension is, it looks like it's tighter. Mm -hmm. um, and so your top thread makes like these it eyelashes. It doesn't pull it up. Right. And that usually happens around sharp curves. If it's happening, if you're, even if you're doing a straight line, well, then something's really jacked up. <laughs> what I do to test that is I do a straight line. And then, and, and I do this when I test on the long arm. I'll run a straight line. And then I'll do a series of loops, and then I'll do a back and forth curved zigzag, and then I get out, go underneath, and I look at it. Mm -hmm. Because my loops should tell me if there's eyelashing. Mm -hmm. My straight line should give me that width, you know, the width. And then the, the, the curved Switch back. switchbacks will show me how it looks on the pivots. Mm -hmm. 
So, and I think if you do that with everyone, you know, it's kind of a consistent test. Yes. So that's what I do. So let's say you got all that worked out. <laughs> yes. How did, what, what designs do you actually use? Oh, that's a, that's a big. <laughs> so I have like three go-tos that work for most piecing designs because I'm not as fancy as Lynn. <laughs> I do a good old meander. Yeah. And this works for my brain because, well, in theory, you're not supposed to have this loopy thing. But look, look at that. I fixed it. <laughs> so the good old meander good old meander that's good for just filling in background or whatever um orange peel is something i started doing about a year and a half ago and that's when you've got a piece like let's call it a square you're just coming in you're doing that to the corners and this distance is about a quarter of an inch now it can be bigger if it's like a really big piece it'll yeah. be up to a half an inch or so and sometimes I've gone in and, like, filled this in with, like, meander or whatever, just kind of scribble in there. <laughs> um, the other thing that I've started doing lately is ribbon candy, and it's mostly in triangles or weird shapes. It's not straight line like fancy people like Angela Walters do. And you got to come in at the top of one, and you're just doing this. And it's just growing and growing and growing. Oh, that's so big. Ah, then it starts shrinking. So those are my three go-to. <laughs> I do all those. I will get fancier, like um, from No Regrets that we looked at on the last episode that was in the magazine where I went and did ruler work with cross hatching, and then you filled in every other one. That gives right. you a, kind of a funky checkerboard look. So there are a ton of books out there with inspiration. Um, Krista Watson has a couple great ones that talk about the mechanics of it as well as giving design inspiration. Angela Walters is always fabulous for that. But be, looking at those can be intimidating because you're just like, uh, I don't, <laughs> I'm not going to be well, Angela I think Walters you, out of the gate. <laughs> no, no, no. I think you just break it up and you practice different, you know, sections. Christina so. Camelli has a good book too about um, freeform designs where it's like, okay, here are basic shapes. Like here's a curve shape. Here's a loop shape. And like right. different ways to combine those. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes for this episode. There's a couple of good books that I've got that I always like, all right, I got to quilt this thing. Let me not go to my three default ones, find some inspiration. Um, right. There's just, there's a ton of, even just going on Pinterest or just Googling free motion quilting. Oh yeah. Or the particular style of quilt that you made, like Dresden plate free motion quilting. And then you can see what other people did. Yep, I think that's good. Pinterest, stuff like that is definitely a place to go look. All right. All right, I think we have so. Anything else? There's so much you could talk about with this. That's why I started to say, there are crafty this is like classes. a huge topic. There are all kinds of online classes all over the place for this. So uh, definitely worth talking about again. Yes. Um, but that's kind of the basics of like setup and, and choosing your design. So. So now we're going to take a closer look at my quilt, and we'll be right back. Okay, our next topic is cost benefit versus for pre-cut fabrics. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's the topic. Yes, and. So I, <laughs> Pam has done math, <laughs> and math is hard. No, actually, I like math. Um, but my guess is that there's not a lot of difference. Like a pre-cut, this is a jelly roll. Jelly roll is, what, 40 pieces of two and a half inch strips. Yep. Which is equal to three yards. Maybe. <laughs> Ish. How many yards is this? Math. You're not going to tell me. You're going to show me in a minute. Um, so I'm I'm guessing, and I could be wrong, that there's not a lot of difference. Okay. But can you go to a quilt shop and say, I would like a two and a half inch strip of this fabric? Um, usually the smallest they'll let you cut is an eighth of a... Eighth of a yard. Yard, which is, I'm trying to do my math now. So a half yard is 
18 inches and half of that is nine and half of that is four and a half. And a half so no. So I can't get two and a half inches. So you got to buy more. But I can get four and a half. Yeah. So it'd be like two jelly rolls. No. Two and a half times two is five. Okay, right. All right. Anyway, show <laughs> so, two. So I did some math. That I should, and we'll use a jelly roll as an example. Okay. Okay. So how much does a jelly roll cost here in the United States? About $40. Yeah. I have $38.99 for mine. So we're trying to figure out is buying all the fabric and doing it yourself more or less than $38.99. Okay. Hold that number in your Now, mind. this jelly roll is 40 different fabrics. 40 different fabrics. Not all jelly rolls are all 40 different fabrics. Sometimes they're repeated. True. Fabrics. We're going to assume that you are going for a jelly roll of print fabric. Okay. Because this is solid. Solid some are usually right, yeah, cheaper. Those, those could be like 35 And I'm going to assume an average price per yard of fabric at $12.99. That's what it is here in the U.S. Yep, I agree. $12.99. Now, I also assume that they wouldn't let you cut an eighth of a yard, that you had to get a quarter of a yard, which is nine inches. Okay. But we're going to make some modifications to accommodate Sometimes that. they will. Okay. So you've got 40 pieces at a quarter yard a piece, twelve ninety nine a yard. That comes out to one hundred and twenty nine dollars and ninety nine cents, not including tax. That's a lot of money. So, and I can buy that for forty. But wait. But wait, there's more. You also have to cut all these strips. Now I can cut a strip of fabric in like shink, you know, two seconds. But you've got to line it up. You got to. You take it out of the stack, full fluff it, iron yes. it, all that good stuff. So let's say it takes you two minutes for each piece <laughs> to cut it. And you're paying yourself quilt shop wages, $10 an hour. Okay. So you're cutting, you got, <laughs> wait, now I think I assumed, I was like, no, I'm going to be cut fast. I'm going to take a minute a piece to cut all these things. So that's going to be 40 minutes. It's 60 minutes an hour because it's an hourly wage times $10 an hour, which means that I am taking labor cost of $6 and 67 cents. Okay. Now, did you walk into the fabric store and immediately instantaneously have all 40 pieces picked that you wanted to cut? Or yes. How long did it take you to find all those fabrics in the store? Well, me compared to somebody else. I make quick fabric decisions, but I can see where it would take somebody a long time. Yes. Let's say it took you an hour. Okay, that's fair. It's fair. Yeah, you an hour. You can spend some time in a, crap, in a fabric store. So, so another $10. $10 an hour. Okay, so when you add up your $12.99 and your $6.57 and your $10, that's a lot. Yes. That is $171.47. Which is 233% more than the cost of a jelly roll. But wait. But wait, there's more. Well, you're going to have extra fabric. Because you only need two and a half inches out of that nine that you got cut. So let's let's back out some fabric costs here. Because you don't need all this 129. So you're really only using 21% of this. Okay. So 21% of 129.99. Okay. $27.30. Would you think, holy moly, that is cheaper than that, but you've got to add in this labor cost. Well, when you add all that up, math, magic is happening. When you add all that up, what do you think it is? 40 something. It's going to be the same thing as the cost of the jelly roll. 43.97. So you're saving $3. You're saving $5. Because if it's thirty eight ninety nine versus forty three, about oh. five dollars. There you go. So, so when you buy, so my guess you may was think, oh, not much different than that. Yeah, it's, it's still not much, not different. much different. It's not much different. Yeah. Now, do you think it's the same for fat quarters? That's not as much cutting. Well, and some of them are already pre cut, so you can just go pick out. Yeah. Whatever. So, in theory, layer cakes are a better deal. 
because you ha- you can't just get a quarter yard to get a 10 inch square because that's right. only nine inches. So you yeah. have to get a third of a yard. Which I is like layer inches. cakes. Yeah. Of the whatever, fat quarters are my favorite, then layer cakes, then jelly rolls. Of the pre cut world. Mm-hmm. And then charm squares. Charm squares are like candy though. Like you just buy, like, oh, I want to, you just it's buy. It's just $11. Yeah, exactly. It's just $11. Let's just do this. Yeah. But I have to admit, I love pre-cuts. I use pre-cuts. This is a pre-cut quilt, and I think it's very dynamic. I, I like how they turn out. For me, though, a lot of times I want extra fabric for background or whatever, so I'm always adding to my pre-cuts. Yeah, yeah. I never make things just that's the only thing I'm using. Yeah. So I'm still always buying more fabric. And... I always like to use part of the cre cut and then add more stuff from my stash so that it gives me a more dynamic right. quilt and unique quilt. Mm-hmm. Right. So. Yeah, because that's one way to personalize it. And we've talked about kits before about, you know, you get the kit that's the same as everyone else. Well, you know, swap out a couple fabrics, mix it up. And really, honestly, buying a fat quarter comparing to buying a half a yard of fabric, I think you get a better deal buying a half a yard of fabric. Than buying a sets of fat quarters. So if fabric is thirteen dollars a yard, mm-hmm. fat quarters are on average three fifty. Three fifty. Three fifty, 350 yep. times four is fourteen dollars. That's right. Yeah. It so is. it's better deal to buy half a yard of fabric. <laughs> I did do math. <gasps> math. So and I get more fabric. So yeah. And half a yard of fabric lets me create. The layer cake. The, the Now, the benefit of these is you get the entire line. You get the, yeah. you get a little bit of a lot of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I, it's a good way to build a scrap stash. Oh, uh, or just like this grunge or, you know, the solids. It's a great way to just have those filler things. So, awesome. But I like variety. So, I buy these, but I also buy yes. extra fabric. Because, you know, that's we, good. We just buy fabric because that's how we roll. Well, really, yeah, that's it. It's just an excuse to buy more fabric. Can we? But I didn't realize all that math. That was good. Yes, yeah, the math. I did that last night. And you, she was very excited. She was like, I'm going to do math. I'm like, okay. Yeah, I whipped out charts a couple have episodes fun ago. With that. Math. Wow, this is getting crazy. It helps to have a nerd on your side. I'm just saying. <laughs> this is why I don't do spreadsheets. She doesn't. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> All righty. So, do you use pre-cuts? Do you have a favorite size? Are you a layer cake lover like Lynn? A lot of L's in there. Layer cake. <laughs> it's alliteration day at the Stitch TV show. Ta-ta. <laughs> so, leave a comment on our blog or YouTube episode and let us know. And that's all we've got for today's episode. This show is made possible by the Pre-Cut Store. You can shop the Yummy Pre-Cut Store yourself at theprecutstore.com. Oh, we would also like to thank 77 <laughs> oh. Beaches, Big Thank Productions, for helping produce the Stitch. <laughs> um, you can find their links to our website on the stitchtvshow.com. And if you're interested in sponsoring the show, please <laughs> email us at info at the stitchtvshow.com. And just ignore Pam while she's laughing at me because now she gets to read. Yeah. And if you enjoy the show, please like it on YouTube. You can share your thoughts on the episodes, topics on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Google+. Plus. Tag us with hashtag the Stitch TV show. Don't forget to enter the giveaway from the pre-cut star for the charm packs and the Moda uh, Bella Snow jelly roll. Ooh, uh, do that before August 24th, 2017, if you're in the future. The next <laughs> virtual stitch in <laughs> is Friday, August 18th at 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern, broadcast on our channel here on YouTube and on our blog. Pam's podcast, Hip to Be a Square, is out on Fridays at hiptobeasquarepodcast.com or on iTunes or Google Play. And don't forget to catch the Celebrity Stitch In interviews, which are now on our YouTube channel and on our blog. You, you can do. email us with questions or comments <laughs> at info at thestitchtvshow.com <laughs> or buy our patterns at shop.thestitchtvshow.com. All these details and more can be found on our website, thestitchtvshow.com. Tune in next time for more quilting chat with friends.